go into the world. And tell every man that you meet, there is a man on the cross. A Catholic take. What you need to know right now. A bold synthesis of inspiration and information. Keeping you up to date on the news and issues from a courageous Catholic perspective. A Catholic Take with Joe McLean starts now. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and it is so good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Hopefully you uh, survived your weekend and it was great. I had a little bit of a bumpy ride over the weekend. Uh, you know, anything that I have to fix somehow never gets actually fixed. That's kind of the story of my life. Maybe I'll share more of that with you in the after show. But uh, we have a great program. Will Japan ever receive the faith? Truly, it's one of the most atheist countries on planet Earth. And so many martyrs have died there. I have one of my favorites, uh, St. Maximilian Kolbe, sent his own missionaries there. And the, the, the very land he purchased to build his monastery there was built on the, the blood seed of the martyrs, actually. So what is the story with Japan? We, we have invited Daniel Suazo, the Jewish Catholic, to be on the program to talk about Japan, its future. Will it ever convert? He will weigh in. At 15 past the hour, though, I want to ask you a question. Would you ever follow a AI created generated religion? Would you read an AI generated version of scriptures? Well, there are people pushing to create a religion that they would say would be correct for all of humanity using artificial intelligence. I'll share that with you at 15 past the hour. So much to discuss today. We're going to be sharing all the links to everything we talk about in the show notes over at thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. That's thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT where you can get not only the show notes, you can join the email list, you can you can get the uh, live video feed there, the podcast is there, and so, so much more. Do us a favor, stop by thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. Let's pray. Let's get started. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and now your Saint of the Day. Pope St. Leo III, pray for us. Leo was a Roman, born in the 8th century. He was a cardinal and the papal treasurer under Pope Adrian I, and was elected Pope himself on the very day his predecessor was buried in 795. Immediately following his election, Leo sent to blessed Charlemagne the standard of Rome and the keys of St. Peter, signs that the Pope considered Charlemagne the protector of the papacy. In return, the honored Charlemagne sent his congratulations and a great treasure of war spoils, which Leo gladly used to the benefit of churches and charities throughout Rome. On April 25, 799, relatives of the late Pope Adrian sent men to attack Leo during the rogation procession. His face was deeply scarred, his eyes gouged, and his tongue nearly ripped out. But he miraculously recovered the use of his eyes and tongue and soon fled to the protection of Charlemagne in Germany. Leo returned to Rome later that same year, acclaimed by the people. And when Charlemagne joined him there the next year, in 800, Leo mercifully interceded with the king to merely exile rather than execute the pope's enemies. Soon afterward, pope and king met again, this time at Christmas Day Mass in St. Peter's. After the singing of the gospel, with a crown in his hands, Pope Leo approached the apparently unsuspecting Charlemagne, who was kneeling before the altar, and placed the crown upon his head, proclaiming him Imperator Romanorum, Emperor of the Romans. The basilica was immediately filled with the cries of the crowd, To Charles, the most pious Augustus, crowned by God, to our great and pacific emperor, life and victory. Under blessed Charlemagne, the Holy Roman Empire would now revive the Roman Empire in the West, with the first and foremost duty of protecting the Church and all Christendom from the enemies of God. After a two-decade reign, Pope Leo died in 816 and was canonized in 1673 by Pope Clement X. Pope St. Leo III, pray for us. And now your headline news. Trending politics reports Archdiocese of Los Angeles stands with Dodgers disavows planned protests. 
In a memo to priests and deacons of the San San Fernando Pastoral Region, Bishop Gerald Wilkerson stressed that planned protests against the team do not have the backing of the Archdiocese, saying, quote, I am aware that some groups are planning various kinds of protests regarding the Dodgers' Pride Night. Please note that none of these has the backing or approval of the Los Angeles Archdiocese, close quote, Wilkerson wrote. He goes on to say, we have decided to take a step back and hope for dialogue with the relevant parties. Leadership of the Archdiocese has instead asked all to enter into prayer, close quote. The memo continued. Bishop Wilkerson's statement differs significantly from that of Bishop Robert Barron of the Diocese of Winona, Rochester, who called for a boycott of the team if they do not reverse their decision. As for the Los Angeles area, many Catholics appear to disagree with Bishop Wilkerson and have planned protests. We'll be covering that this week as well. Ground News reports Unabomber died of suicide. Ted Kaczynski, known as the Unabomber who carried out a 17-year bombing campaign that killed three people and injured 23 others, died by suicide over the weekend. Fox News reports Biden accused of flag code violation. President Joe Biden's administration is facing a backlash over its Pride Month display at the White House, as critics say it violates the U.S. flag code. Biden on Saturday posted a photograph of a set of flags hanging from the White House. The display includes a Pride flag flanked by two American flags. Let that sink in. Also, Robert Nugent uh, from uh, from his uh, Determined to Be Catholic YouTube channel is reporting that a gay performer, Roberto Boli, was allowed to perform half naked in St. Peter's Square near the outdoor altar. He was allowed to do this by Vatican officials, the very same officials who have banned the traditional Latin mass at St. Peter's Basilica. Let that sink in. And those are your headline news. The gospel today comes to us from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. Thus they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Ooh, such a good gospel. This was... The Matthew chapter five, the Beatitudes was had a profound effect on me in a mystical experience that I had back in 2002 and remains uh, pretty much a highlight in my life to this very day. But the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible said on the mountain, this is very key for us here. The setting recalls the giving of the law on Mount Sinai, Exodus 19 through 24. However, Moses brought the law down the mountain to the people, whereas Jesus delivers his teaching teaching to disciples who have come up the mountain. That's super key because you might recall, if you go back to Exodus 19 through 24, the people were were not disposed to be in the presence of the Lord. They were not imperfect. They didn't purify themselves the way they were asked to, and therefore they could not be in the presence of God unless they be consumed completely in the fire of his love. Because only that which is perfect is left over. This is what St. Paul refers to when he speaks of purgatory, the fires of purgatory, which destroy the wood, the straw, the stubble, and leave only the purified gold and silver and the precious things. So if you are not 
purified, you cannot enter into heaven. The commentary goes on to say the mountain signifies the higher precepts of righteousness for the precepts given to Israel were lower. God gave lesser laws to those requiring the bonds of fear, but higher laws to those ready to be set free by love. The higher precepts are for the kingdom of heaven, just as the lower precepts were for a kingdom on earth. He sat down, the posture of a Jewish rabbi speaking with authority. Hadock's commentary, quoting Chrysostom quite extensively today, says, It is not without reason that the Beatitudes are disposed of in this order. Each preceding one prepares the way for what immediately follows, furnishing us in particular with spiritual arms of such graces as are necessary for obtaining the virtue of the subsequent Beatitude. Thus the poor in spirit i.e. the truly humble, will mourn for their transgressions, and whoever is filled with sorrow and confusion for his own sins cannot but be just and behave to others with meekness and clemency. When possessed of these virtues, he then becomes pure and clean of heart. Peace of conscience reigns in the assemblage of virtues and cannot be expelled the soul by any tribulations, persecutions, or injustices of men. Chrysostom would go on to say, Many are merciful to the poor and just in their dealings, but abstain not from the luxury and lust. Therefore, our Savior, wishing to show that mercy was not sufficient, adds that if we would see God, we must also be possessed of the virtue of purity. Hadock's commentary would say, If you participate in the sufferings of the prophets, you will equally participate in their glory and their reward. Let that sink in today. If you participate in the sufferings of the prophets, you will equally participate in their glory and their reward. Are we prepared to do that? Let's talk more about that on the other side of this quick break when AI-generated scriptures and religion are on the horizon. Hear what listeners are saying about the free iCatholic Radio mobile app. Through the iCatholic Radio app, I have listened to the sermons and teachings several times. The effect has been a deeper understanding of my faith and Catholic tradition. This app has truly been a blessing in my life and has increased my faith. Listen live or at your convenience to your favorite shows. Just search for iCatholic Radio in your app store today. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McClain. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Coming up at 30 past the hour, Daniel Suazo is going to be our guest. He is uh, the uh, Jewish Catholic over on YouTube. We've had him on not all that long ago, a couple of weeks ago, maybe. But he's going to be back on because Daniel has something very interesting. He lives in Japan. And Japan is very interesting because... It's one of the most atheistic countries on the planet. Why didn't the blood seed of the martyrs there convert that country? Is it possible to see that country convert in the future? Those are all questions that we want to explore with Daniel Suazo coming up at 30 past the hour. Do join us if you can. But uh, there's another topic that I saw today that I felt was very important. It concerns me and I'm sure it concerns you too. There is a professor out of Israel who it works with the World Economic Forum. He's an advisor to Klaus Schwab, and he is talking about artificial intelligence and a created religion using AI to generate scriptures that he would say are correct and that would benefit all of mankind. That he would want all of mankind to embrace this one correct religion that is AI generated. Golly gee whiz, what could go wrong? Let's hear from him directly. Jake, would you roll that clip, please? The third thing about AI that everybody needs to know, it's the first technology ever that can create new ideas. You know, the printing press, radio, television, they broadcast, they spread the ideas created by the human brain, by the human mind. They cannot create a new idea. You know, Gutenberg printed the Bible, in the middle of the 15th century. The, the, the printing press printed as many copies of the Bible as Gutenberg instructed it, but it did not create a single new page. 
it had no ideas of its own about the Bible. Is it good? Is it bad? How to interpret this? How to interpret that? Um, AI can create new ideas, can even write a new Bible. We, you know, throughout history, religions dreamt about having a book written by a superhuman intelligence, by a non-human entity. Every religion claims our book, all the other books of the other religions, they, humans wrote them. But our book, no, 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 no. It came from some superhuman intelligence. In a few years, there might be religions that are actually correct. That just think about a religion whose holy book is written by an AI. That could be a reality in a few years. You know, this um, is his name is you, Yuval Noah Harari. Like He's the senior advisor to the WEF, and its chairman Klaus Schwab argues that using AI to replace scriptures will create a unified quote religions that are actually correct close quote. Let that sink in for a second. They're going to use artificial intelligence to create religion to rewrite the scriptures because in their worldview. The scriptures, religions, they're all man-made. And in their worldview, they have the right, therefore, if you can invent your religion, why can't they invent theirs? It is pretty scary to think about. And I want to ask you a question. If they do this and they use artificial intelligence to create a new version of sacred scripture, if they use artificial intelligence to create a unified religion, would you embrace that? Would you embrace that? What if your neighbors do? What if your siblings do? What if your children, your, your adult children who have walked away from Holy Mother Church in college uh, because getting the paper on the wall was just far was too big of a priority rather than seeing them remain faithfully Catholic. So what if they do that? Will you do that? Will you walk away if everyone in the world around you embraces a artificial intelligence-driven set of the Holy Scriptures or religion? Would you walk away? I'm curious because the reality is I think most will. That's the reality, at least in my world. Now, I do believe that there will be many that won't. I certainly believe that there are many faithful who won't buy that. They will see it for what it is, artificially into, uh, to, uh, artificially generated and created um, nonsense that they will simply not embrace. And praise be to God for that. But the reality is your neighbors, your friends, your coworkers, people on the street that you're going to meet, they will embrace this. And they will do so in a big way. Now, this particular professor here, um, Yuval Harari, he's a very interesting character because not only of his beliefs in artificial intelligence, but in his beliefs in population control. This article that I'm reading over at slaynews.com, we will link to it and the video itself in today's show notes over at the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. That's the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. We post these show notes. Producer Jake posts them every single day, right? When we get off the air, he puts them up so that you can access every story we've ever talked about during the hour. But uh, this professor not only embraces artificial intelligence, its risks and its benefits, but also population control. He says that in a brave new world where AI is taking over and being used to do these simple things, the normal things that humans have, has, have always done, there's not a need for that many humans anymore. And the future oligarchs, the future you know, uh, elitists, people like Klaus Schwab, for instance, won't have a need for as many human beings as we do today. He makes clear distinctions. The question is, who gets to decide which humans get to live and which humans get to die? Which humans are valuable and which ones are not? Who gets to decide that? I'm curious. I wonder if he gets to decide that. I wonder if he would put himself in a category that is valuable or not valuable. College you is, what do you think he'll do? Um, yeah, I think so too. But here's the reality. There's so much question, and there always has been. This goes back all the way to the Garden of, of Eden, the fall of mankind. We begin to question God. We begin to question his motives, and we, get, we, we begin to rebel. And so we eat of the fruit and we fall. And that fallen human nature has come down to our age. But the reality is, as St. Paul makes clear in his epistle, that the world is growing darker by the day. And the result is a great apostasy. And it's only after the great apostasy do we see the man of perdition revealed to mankind 
And then, and only then, will the second coming happen, and then justice. The time of mercy is now, but we must endure the suffering along the way. And so many people will, it will embrace error over truth. And I believe they do so because they're trying to relativize. They're trying to rationalize their choices. They look everywhere else. Something we talked about, I think it was last week, we were referring to the alien story. You know, how we have this whistleblower that came out. We put our backs to Holy Mother Church and we look away from her. We look for the truth everywhere else but to Holy Mother Church. And so this professor is calling into question divine revelation, sort of assuming that everyone, uh, that the apostles who wrote them, right, uh, uh, the, the church that perpetuated the, the gospels, perpetuated St. Paul's epistles, St. Peter, St. John, you know, take, taking these writings and making sure they spread throughout Christianity. The, the assumption is they were all lying. Why is that? Based on what? Based on what do you assume that they were simply making it up or, or lying? The reality is divinely revealed scripture has come down to us through the ages, passed on one generation to the next with great consistency, true to history, true to the miracles. It's common sense. It just makes sense. But it is denied completely all the way. But the telephone game, don't you know? I mean, if you played the telephone game in school, you remember playing the telephone game. It never, you know, the, the story changed. So it, listen, who uses the telephone game to pass on something so precious as divine revelation? Who does this? Never in a time in the entire history of the world was there a, a time when sacred scripture existed like an island to itself. The Old Testament, which remains incredibly consistent to the oldest possible copies that we have on record, which, if I'm not mistaken, are the Dead Sea Scroll versions. If you match them to your Bible today, you pull out the Dead Sea Scrolls, go through, you will see a very consistent application to the translation that you buy off the shelf today to the oldest possible versions. Same thing in the New Testament. You see incredible consistency. You don't see major changes. You don't see the telephone game going on because never in a time in history did sacred scripture uh, become an island to itself. There was always an ecclesia. There was always a body of Christ to care for it, to be stewards of it, to teach it, to preach it, to proclaim it, to pass it on. In the Old Testament, you had to know you had to know what the vowels were. You, you, you were missing letters the entire time. Only the ecclesia had the ability to properly translate it and pass that on to the next generation. You would never pass on something so flippantly, so casually as the telephone game that is something so beautiful, so incredible, so precious to you as divine revelation. You would take great care and great concern to ensure that you were passing something on that is precious to your family, the ecclesia of God, the assembly, the body, the church of God. You would take so much care that, in fact, you might even uh, say that, hey, so-and-so tried to create their own sacred scripture, and that is rejected. They change, like Martin Luther, changing scripture because he wanted to. Well, that is rejected because nobody sent Martin Luther to do such a thing. That is heresy. He was a heretic, and that was wrong. And the church proclaimed that, and it ought to. It needs to, and it still needs to do that today. That is the mission of the church. That is the organization of the church, which remains obviously very, very consistent down through the ages, passed on from one, one generation to the next. You have a very consistent material quality quality to Holy Mother Church, to that ecclesia. And that is the church that's handing on sacred scripture. So they're denying, they're making accusations, claiming that these men just simply made it up. And that is not at all in keeping with reality. They had no motivation. You have nothing to believe that they were lying to you. And herein lies, I think, the real crux of the matter, the real, the real hinge pin and all of this. And that is God sent his only begotten son into the world. Christianity is unique because its founder, Jesus the Christ, Christ isn't his last name. Christ is an identifier as the Messiah. Jesus the Messiah is God. Buddha is not God. Muhammad isn't God. Okay, Jesus claimed to be God. 
Don't believe me? John 14. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. John 8. He claims to be God so explicitly, repeatedly in John 8 that it becomes a sledgehammer to the heart of those that would deny that. Like Jehovah's Witnesses, for instance. Jesus claimed to be God. He's not just a good man. He's not just a prophet. You know, he's not just a, a teacher. He claimed to be God. Thomas the Apostle worshipped him as God. We worship Jesus as God. Present body, blood, soul, and, body, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Holy Eucharist. That is either true or it is not true. There's no in-between. There's no gray area here. There's no middle ground. Jesus is, in fact, God as he claims to be. That's either true or it's not true. If it is true, your life must therefore necessarily change completely. Because if he is, in fact, who he claimed to be, then the kingdom of David, the kingdom of God, is upon you. And your life must therefore change. But the reality is, how many people will, will refuse to change? They don't want to change. They want to rationalize their choices. They want to make they want to make it so that the sins they have committed, the brokenness in their life, all the mistakes, the baggage, and everything else somehow gets, you know, wiped away without having the guilt of, of bad choices, the consequence of bad choices. So they reject God, who revealed himself as the Messiah who gave us his church, who's passed it down to our age. AI generated scripture and AI generated religion is all about getting you to reject God. You must stand firm. You must stand firm. We'll be right back. More breaking news and stories and Daniel Suazo is coming up next. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and here are your headline news. Epic Times reports Zuckerberg saying the establishment asked to censor COVID-19 posts that ended up being true. Big tech firms were asked to censor COVID-19 information that ended up being true. Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg has assessed. U.S. officials pressured Facebook and Instagram to censor posts, emails disclosed in court cases, and through Freedom of Information Act requests have shown, quote, just take some of the stuff around COVID earlier in the pandemic where there were real health implications, but there hasn't been time to fully vet a bunch of the scientific assumptions. Close quote, Zuckerberg, whose company is the parent of Facebook and Instagram, said during a discussion with podcaster Lex Friedman that was released on June 8th, going on to say, quote, and unfortunately, I think a lot of the establishment on that kind kind of waffled on a bunch of facts and asked for a bunch of things to be censored that in retrospect ended up being more debatable or true, close quote, adding, it really undermines trust. You think, Zuck? I think so too. New York Post reports at least 13 people shot, stabbed, or hit by cars in Syracuse Street Party. Hundreds of people were gathered on the 100 block of Davis Street in the city's west side when gunfire rang out at 12.22 a.m., Syracuse Police Spokesman Lieutenant Matthew Malinowski said in a press release. Police said four people were shot, six were stabbed or cut, and three who were hit by vehicles driving away from mayhem. The injured included three men and 10 women, ranging in age from 17 to 25. All were expected to survive. Praise be to God for that. The crowd had gathered for a block party advertised on social media. A neighbor told the outlet a fight broke out just before midnight but ended quickly before another scuffle erupted about 20 minutes later and dozens of gunshots rang out. In the Post Millennial reports, California moves to provide surrogates to gay male couples in the name of fertility equality. California Bill SB 729 seeks to redefine infertility to be a status as opposed to a medical condition. Changing the definition to a person's inability to reproduce either as an individual or with their partner without medical intervention would classify gay men as infertile. The bill, which passed the state last month, would require insurance companies to cover in vitro fertilization procedures. With the change in definition, this would also include forcing the firms to cover surrogacy for gay males, thus compounding mortal sin with more mortal sin. And those 
are your headline news. Praise be to God. A special shout out to our 300 club members on ICR. Good morning to the 300 or so that are hanging out with us every morning on the a Catholic Take program on iCatholic Radio. I love having you guys on the team. Thank you for doing it. You can always download iCatholic Radio in your mobile app store, Android or iOS. Listen to Catholic Radio 24-7, clear as crystal from anywhere on planet Earth. You can get the podcast of this program, Father Mateg's program, and many other programs right through the app. You can watch the live video feed there and so much more. Do us a favor, download the iCatholic Radio and become a member of the 300 Club. Praise be to God. Joining us right now is Daniel Suazo, the Jewish Catholic over on the YouTube channel. Praise be to God. Daniel, good morning to you. Good morning, Joe. How's it going? Praise be to God. I am alive, and that counts, and I'm glad you're on the team today, so thank you for doing it. I'd like to say uh, thanks for getting up early, but actually, it's like you're going to bed late. I mean, you live in Japan. I think that makes you very fascinating, actually. I looked it up, and I've always known that. No, I didn't look you up. I looked up. Uh, I looked up the, the where Japan is on the scale. I've always known mm-hmm. Japan is one of the most atheist countries on planet Earth, but it turns out mm-hmm. it's not the most. And I think I've been saying it's the most for now for a long time. So I have to correct myself here. But let me just give you the top ten most atheistic countries on planet Earth, and I'd like to get your reaction to that. Coming in at number ten sure. is Uruguay. Uruguay. Uruguay is at number 10. The Netherlands at number 9. No surprise there. Latvia is at number Mm -hmm. 8. South Korea is at number 7. China is at 6. I would have said China is number 2 or 1, but it's not. Mm -hmm. China is at number 6. Hong Kong is at number 5. So Hong Kong, the free state, is more atheistic than the communist state. Let that sink in. Japan comes in Mm -hmm. at number 4. Estonia at three, North Korea at two, and the Czech Republic. Who I did, I, I did Czech Republic? I wouldn't have put them on this list, but they are at number one. It blows my mind that Japan is at number four and not. I always thought it was the it was the worst offender, but it is not. You live there. Uh, mm-hmm. What is it like there? Yep. Well. Looking at what that list is, I'm surprised about the other countries just because I don't know too much about all of them. But I'm not too surprised in regards to the the number in which Japan falls into. And that's because being here, number one, I didn't expect anything at all. When you spend a little bit of time, you realize that spirituality seems to be a big deal. But then when you start really looking into it, you learn that everything that has to do with religion here is pretty much cultural. None of it has anything to do with them believing things. You might find a couple of people here and there that perhaps believe in the deities of Shinto or in the tenets of Buddhism, but you're not really going to find anybody who seriously thinks about it. That's the, that's the real thing. If you ask them, if you really, even the people that say that they believe, if you dissect into the conversation, you're going to notice that it's true. This is a pretty atheistic country, but there are some Catholics. But there are some Catholics. You know, one of my favorites uh, is St. Maximilian Kolbe. Uh, I am a uh, yeah. big devotee of St. Maximilian Kolbe. And I just love this book here, Father Kolbe in Nagasaki. Great book. I really, really enjoyed this. It was a Christmas present uh, a couple of Christmases ago yeah. now. A really great book. And one of the things I loved about uh, the story here is, of his time spent in Nagasaki, he didn't die there. He died in Germany or in Poland. But nonetheless, mm-hmm. when he went to Japan... He wanted to purchase some land. He obtained permission from the diocese. And the land that he was able to get was land that nobody else really wanted. And that was because it was land where Christians had been martyred. And uh, he didn't know that when he first found the land. But when he finally bought the land in Nagasaki, he discovered on his property, on the property that belonged to his order, there was a hidden crucifix placed under a, uh, I think it was a Buddhist a statue or some sort of statue. It was this, this crucifix was left over from the martyrs of the Christians and it was hidden there. And it was there that he set up the grotto to Our Lady, which the locals destroyed and he had to keep rebuilding it. Every time they would destroy it, he'd rebuild it. The blood seed of the martyrs. Um, so many died in Japan. Why didn't Japan yeah. take to the faith given the sacrifice of so many? 
Yeah. Well, this has a lot to do with the actual culture and because back in the day, it really was more founded in Shinto and Buddhism. It was really, really tied into it. Uh, it's, it's a modern thing that you notice that people are kind of departing even from their own faith. But you see this across pretty much every religion around the world right now. But um, in the earlier years, we're talking about probably 1200s, yeah, maybe perhaps even before that, uh, Japan was really a country that was deep in ritual, deep in, in their own faith, and everything revolved around it. Imagine what you would expect Catholicism to be like, where it's not just something you do on Sunday, but rather life is, is affected by it. And I like to give this example for Shinto. For example, they believe that in every single grain of rice, there are seven gods that live in each grain of rice. Just to give you an idea wow. of how wow. deep their belief goes. So, yeah, it, it's something that it was really solid for them because of the fact that, that they had such strong ritual tied to every facet of their lives. I think that's what made it really difficult for Catholicism to bloom quickly. Yeah. And it's, it's fascinating to me because if you look at, like, say, uh, the Aztecs, uh, another region mm -hmm. and time that I absolutely have spent a lot of time reading about and studying, mm -hmm. the Aztecs had, had uh, opportunities to, to convert. I mean, Hernan Cortez mm -hmm. uh, preached the gospel himself personally to the indigenous mm -hmm. people there, and many converted. And then, of course, he, mm -hmm. defeated, he defeated the Aztec Empire, thus destroying Satan himself in his own temple, mm -hmm. in his own lair. And then, of course, Our Lady comes a few years later, not even all that, like 10 years later, she's there, and she, uh, and she leads to a mass conversion of millions, and it spread like wildfire. Yeah. So it still seems strange to me that in Japan, with so many um, who have similar pagan uh, practices, maybe not 100% equal, because uh, as far as I know, there mm. were no, were there human sacrifices in, in some of their ancestral cults in Japan? No, they wouldn't uh, offer other people as sacrifices. Life was seen as valuable, even in their own ritual of seppuku or harikiri, where they take their own lives. Well, mm -hmm. this would be primarily the samurai that would do this, like when they would fail uh, in a battle and out of honor, the opponent would let them take their own lives. Um, but that's pretty much it. But I think there's there's more to that because of the fact that, uh, for example, the emperor would be seen as a god himself, right? So being that mm -hmm. they could see the god, that they could go there and worship this god, it would make it a little bit more difficult compared to the Aztecs where um, it, it was more, there were many gods, but nobody could really see them. You could see sculptures, you could see things, but you never knew of a living God amongst them where with the emperor you did have that so perhaps maybe that played a little bit of a role into it so okay so the people there are they practical agnostics then so if they're not really if they're culturally still spiritual according to their ancestral practices mm -hmm. I guess they're going to mm -hmm. some sort of temple on occasion they get married in their yeah. temples or I mean what, what is that like exactly yeah that's for New Year's, that's one of the big days, right? So imagine the Christians or the Catholics would go to church on Easter only, right? That's basically what almost the majority of Japanese people would be for New Year's. New Year's, they're always going to go to the to the shrine. They're going to offer up their prayers and they get uh, certain elements, almost like what we would know as sacramentals uh, that they would use as part of their rituals. And then, of course, during weddings, you would have that. Uh, there's also times for, it's called Chichigo-san, which is basically like a coming of age. So when girls turn th uh, three years old and then when they become around 16, almost similar to a quinceañera for folks that know what that is. So there are different parts of their lives where they still go and they participate it. But again, it's more ritualistic, Versus actually them believing in a faith, per se. Mm. All right. So St. Paul in Acts, I think it was, uh, was it 21, uh, where he goes to a Athens and he speaks to these people. Mm -hmm. And he says, I can see you're very religious. Look at all these temples. You, got, mm -hmm. man, you guys got lots of altars. And there's even one yep. to an unknown God. Like, wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. So he, he changed his tactic up based on his audience that he was talking to. But it seems like it could be applicable here with the Japanese. They are living... Yep quasi 
religious, quasi atheistic life. And I, I imagine that also affects like the way, is this the reason why they're having no children in Japan? I mean, it, how is abortion there? How, how is addictions there? What is crime like mm. there? Like how does their life, their choices, their, the way that they're living this quasi spiritual, quasi atheistic life, how does that roll out into like the symptoms we see of society degrading around us? Well, Man, I, I gotta say, I think Japan is a very, very special place. And I've mentioned this before, and I think I mentioned it to you in a prior email, that I really, really believe that God has something special for Japan. And the reason why I say that is because if you look at this culture, you look at the way that things run around, it's a very tight knit country. It's very Japanese, right? In every facet of it. It's, um, the, the word is escaping me, but everybody here is primarily Japanese, right? You get a couple of foreigners here and there, but it's very few and far in between, especially when you go into the countryside. Um, so it's very Japanese in all facets of its culture and in their beliefs. Even from a small age, they're taught certain principles that will permeate for the rest of their life, like loyalty and honor and respect for the elder. Um, the idea of working for one company and you start in that company and you stay there till basically till you die. Uh, that's another thing that wow. a lot of people might not know about, but that's definitely part wow. of Japanese culture. There's a lot of devotion. Hold that thought right there. Daniel Suazo is our guest. He's the Jewish Catholic over on YouTube. You can check out his channel, youtube.com, at the Jewish Catholic. We're going to put a link to his channel on our show notes today, which you'll find. As soon as we go off the air, Jake begins putting them on the website at thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. We'll link to his channel. Great stuff. Daniel's been on a journey coming into the Catholic Church, and we've had some fascinating conversations. But we're talking about Japan. How exactly might we see a total conversion of the Japanese people? I want to get into that. What do we need to do? And what is the Catholic faith like there? That's coming up next. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Coming up at the top of the hour, we say goodbye to our radio audience and we stay on the live video feed for what we call the after show where you get to drive the conversation. Whatever you want to talk about, that's on the agenda. You can do that by commenting. Go to the stationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. You can see the live video feed there or the links just underneath it where you can find places like YouTube or Twitter or Facebook to rumble is there as well. You can comment live, but the best place is our insiders over on the telegram group, which you can only access unless you're on the email list. So join the insiders email list as well at the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. Daniel Suazo is our guest. The Jewish Catholic is his YouTube channel. We're going to link to it. It's amazing. I encourage you to check it out. So much great content there. Uh, Daniel, welcome back. Now, I did see another list here. Okay, so that same mm -hmm. article where Japan was number four on that list at 60% mm -hmm. most most uh, le or least religious. Well, there's other ways to look at it. The top 10 least religious countries by total non-believers. Japan comes in at number two there. China's at number one mm. for obvious reasons. They have a lot more sure. people. But Japan comes in at number two on that version of the list. And we've been talking about Japan and its status uh, when it comes to the faith. So let's get into what is the status of the Catholic Church in Japan today? How fervent, how strong? Is it growing? Is it declining? Is it is it uh, being destroyed by modernism like it is in so many other places? Mm -hmm. What is the status of the lay faithful uh, in in Japan so I will say that I have a different perspective than perhaps what you might see in polls, right? Because of being here in the ground and seeing the real deal. I've been to several parishes in different parts of Tokyo, in Chiba, in different parts of the Kanto region of Japan. I've been to different parishes. Everyone that I've been to has been pretty much jam-packed. And it's not wow. just older people like what most people say in, in uh, American churches, for example. It's young people, it's families, it's children, it's older people. You have a mixture. And just to give you an idea, this past Easter vigil here at the parish where I go to now, it was tremendously full. And of course, my only Ooh. experience of Catholicism has been in Japan. But going in and seeing that, it was 
it was amazing when the lights were off, everybody had candles. I almost mm -hmm. started crying because of how beautiful it was. Now, that's in the parishes. That's where the centers are. But when you step away, that's when things start to look a little bit more like the poles, which is there doesn't seem to be a lot of Catholicism in this country. So if you take general Christianity, you want to lump in Protestantism, it's still a small group. So it's even smaller when you go into the Catholic circle. But where there are Catholics, the Catholics seem to be very devoted. And I think that's a very Japanese trait that they would be, again, as I mentioned prior before the break, that they are very devoted people. They're people that are accustomed to ritual. Uh, even here where we only primarily have the Novus Ordo, for example, in the sign of the peace. Uh, what they would do is just a simple Japanese style bow takes less than, you know, maybe five, six seconds for the whole part to pass. And it's very, every single one of them have been very smooth, very organized, very quiet. It's very Japanese in that sense. But mm -hmm. their participation and devotion is there. So I think that's a beautiful thing to take. Even though the number might be small, the people that are are very devoted. So, okay, um, how is uh, sharing the faith there? Is it a culture that would reject <laughs> sharing the faith and they would classify it as, as uh, proselytizing? You know, unfortunately, uh, our, His Holiness Pope Francis recently criticized someone for sharing the faith and bringing people into the church. You know, so a lot of people mm. see every effort to share the faith as proselytizing. Do the Japanese see it that way? Can you proclaim the gospel to strangers there? What is that like? So, of course, there's the aspect of language that poses a barrier for me. Now, I speak Japanese, but when it comes to uh, religious terminology, when it comes to explaining things like the Trinity, I wouldn't even know how to say those things. So those things pose mm. a difficulty for anybody who is like me. Uh, but I will say that there are, of course, younger people that speak Japanese and English. And these would be people that I would meet, for example, through my wife, people that I would, might meet through work. And those folks, even if they are Japanese, I have been blessed with the opportunity to start bringing these conversations in. And one of the big hurdles that I will confront outside of the language and culture barriers is, I'll give you an example through my wife herself, which is that from a youth, they're taught that religion is for the weak-minded, right? And they also had a really oh, wow. uh, horrible situation here in Japan where there was this cult leader that got many people to follow his cult, and he performed many, you know, attacks on different parts of the of Tokyo and in Japan, you know, taking lives away from people, things like that. So that's a an image that was seared into the minds of people when they think of religion. They think of these type of nutcases. But little by little, it's starting to smooth away. And I think the approach for me when I speak to people like this is targeting what you see happening around the world. So it's good that you asked earlier in regards to how, how is Japan and Catholicism affected in regards to what is happening around the world with um, this progressive agendas that you would see, liberalism. I think uh, when I can open the eyes to people the eyes of people to look around the world, they'll see that there is definitely undeniably something wrong with the world. And it seems to be getting worse faster and faster. So I begin with that conversation and then you can take him into the route of talking about, well, do you believe that there is a creator? Do you think that the world just came into be? And a lot of times it would be just parroting arguments. And this is also very classical Japanese. No offense to any Japanese uh, folks that may be watching <laughs> the or listening to the show, but it's a very Japanese thing to just parrot something or repeat something that you have learned. School is the very same way. You're not really learning as much as you are memorizing. Memorizing. So when when they bring arguments like, you know, the classic, I believe in science, I don't believe in God. When we as mm -hmm. Catholics understand this to be a complete non-starter because we believe that science is the study of God's creation. So I would introduce these type of topics. Okay, so do you believe there was a creator? Why not? Let's converse about this. Little by little, getting them into the point of, okay, so let me introduce you to this person, Jesus. And then I will continue the conversation. The good thing is that I've had people that are actually listening just 
not this past Sunday, but the prior one, one of my wife's friends, a Japanese young lady, decided all on her own after previous conversations that we had, she said, hey, can I go to Mass with you? And then she came with us and really enjoyed it. So praise God for that. Wow. Yeah, amen. Praise be to God. So, so I guess then inviting someone to mass is perfectly fine. They they'll they, that's not uh, looked down upon in society. You know, if that you know you're not because I know if you go like to India, for instance, if you tried to share the faith mm -hmm. the faith in India, you could be beaten to death by a mob. Same thing in Pakistan, yeah. for instance, you could be you know convicted yeah. of blasphemy and then executed, stoned to death, or some crazy stuff like that. So, I guess there mm -hmm. you invite someone, they come, no big deal. No big deal. Yeah, that's one thing that I can say that I really appreciate. And it's also because of the fact that Japanese people love cultural experiences and they love seeing things that are new to them. So bringing them in is actually a really good thing. And this is the place to do that. If you feel like you want to invite a Japanese friend, you should and don't hesitate. Amen. So we're going to run out of time here really quickly. So what is it going to take to convert this country? Um, do you mm -hmm. see a time where Japan may mass convert? I think so. I think so. And I think this is going to be one of those big moves like what we saw in South America with Our Lady of Guadalupe. I think uh, devotion to Our Lady of Akita would be a great place to begin. I think the rosary is going to be the weapon for this move to happen. As a matter of fact, this is something that I'm trying to organize with one of the local parishes as well. Uh, with it, It's mainly foreigners, but this is something that I'm really working towards. So devotion to Our Lady of Akita and a lot of prayer. Amen. Uh, Our Lady of Akita. I'll start saying it that way. I've been saying it as Akita for now for years. It's uh, Akita. I'll have to say it. Yeah, when you say Akita. it, it sounds cool. <laughs> Praise be to God. <laughs> Daniel Suazo is our guest today. Uh, the Jewish Catholic is his YouTube channel. Uh, he's got a great video of the recent one, Protestantism Makes No Sense. Really great stuff. I encourage you to check that out. We'll put a link to it in the show notes today over at the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. Daniel, God bless you. God love you. We appreciate your time today. God bless. Thank you so much for having me on. Take care. That's going to do it for the radio side of our show today. We're, we're going to go into the after show. We'd love for you to be a part of that. You can catch the live video feed over on our website at thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT.